I opted for the electrical tape camouflage. Yeah, we might be stupid, but we're living an amazing life. Doing cool. What is up, Rad Potential YouTube? I'm Mr. Rad, and welcome to today's video. We are going to be doing a cannonball run attempt for the fastest rotary powered cannonball run record. Now, that's like saying you've got the fastest Street Outlaws, Big Chief guy say, I've got the fastest 1970 GTO judge on a Tuesday in Oklahoma. Okay, so we're getting pretty specific with our record here. Namely, it's just rotary engine. I don't think anybody has done one in a rotary engine ever. I reached out to Ed Bullion who I know as the keeper of the cannonball records at Vin Wiki. He said, I don't think anybody has ever done it. So we're gonna do it. Literally, we just have to make it and we can say that we're the fastest rotary engine cannonball run record holder. So the goal is we're taking the most reliable rotary powered vehicle, which is my green machine, 2004 Mazda RX-8. It is the most reliable rotary vehicle. I will argue it on end. That RX-8s are plenty reliable. Mine always start. The yellow one included with its crazy turbo madness, it always starts. So here's the deal. This is a stock RX-8. It is not low compression, but it is also not high compression. So it is, you know, it makes 95 PSI on all faces. This is a junkyard motor with only three bolts holding it to the transmission because remember the guy exploded the clutch, which then destroyed the back of the engine, which meant I got it for cheap, so I put it in my car. So that's basically the setup on here. Now, as far as the rest of the chassis preparations, it's got tine springs, white line sway bars, fancy poly bushings, Hawk HT10, real aggressive pads. Currently we're sitting on 17s with Falcon RT660s, but that's gonna change because we probably need to keep a little bit lower of a profile than my fake TE37 wheels. So we're gonna be swapping these out for some stock wheels and just some nice all season tires. The yellow headlights delivery, all of that stuff has to go in a sense of, we don't want people to know that it's an RX-8, but I don't think there's any other car to disguise this as, as we've seen previous cannonballers disguising their Mercedes, Audis, all sorts of things as other cars. We're kind of just stuck with the extended cab pickup truck of sports cars here. So we're just gonna go for it, but I am gonna unstripe it and unsticker it. We're gonna try to just be greenish, blackish, Everyone says the car's black, I say it's green. Blur, driving across the country at a reasonable rate of speed. So, let's get to prepping this car for the Cannonball. So I went out and found a used pontoon boat fuel tank. This thing holds about 40 gallons of fuel or so he says. It's literally giant. But the measurements mean that it fits between the RX-8 strut towers pretty much perfectly. So I wedged this thing in here. Had to chop out the center seat brace, which is no big deal. Easily replaceable part for an RX-8 and got the fuel tank situated in the car. As far as safety and mounting this thing, I figured some ratchet straps, maybe some pieces of wood or some foam to wedge under it. It's not going anywhere and ideally we just don't wreck the car. The fatigue life of RX-8 sheet metal, approximately eight bends back and forth. Oh yeah. We have more space than we know what to do with. Ow. Put about five gallons in the tank. Took this thing for a test ride just to shake all the loose debris out of this old pontoon boat fuel cell. So now I'm gonna use this little electric science pump here and I'm gonna pump the fuel out back into the five gallon jug. That way I can put fresh fuel in this tank and it's all Nice, clean, hunky-dory and all of that. I also installed a filter in line with my transfer pump such that we don't just make our RX-8 mad trying to drive across the country. There's definitely some crust down in this fuel tank that I want to get out. Time for the shop back. We're sitting just below half a tank. I just put five gallons of gas in the big tank and we're gonna try to transfer this into the stock tank. You should see that start to go up. Nah, it's working. Super pumped. I don't think it's gonna necessarily go that fast, but 
What should we spill it up? The other question is, what's the refresh rate of an RX-8 fuel gauge? And now that we've pumped some, and even if I turn my pump off, I can see that this is still going up a little bit, so it's catching up. So I don't know how much flow this pump is rated for, but it definitely pumped about two gallons or so out of this big tank into the stock tank in about 40 seconds to a minute. So it's ripping pretty good. We're restricting it a little bit with this filter. Obviously we gotta suck it up back down to here. We should have now that this is all primed up, kick it on and let it ride. And you can see just in that little one minute segment, now we've gone from a tick below a half to now a tick above a half. The other thing that's gonna be interesting to see is that I don't have any fuel leaks right now, but where I am pumping into the stock tank is below what maximum fill is on the stock tank. So the fuel pump setups in the RX-8, like what you see right here, with this being a saddle tank, there's actually part of the tank that goes up above even that yet. So, you know, if you say, had a leak at one of your fuel line fittings, you'd only be able to fill your car up to just over halfway without it just pouring out on the ground. So I'm curious to see how this pump can overcome the head of the stock tank if I can fill it past the level in the stock tank. Hopefully you're not confused with all that hydraulic science, but, but it's interesting to me to think about how the hydraulics of the system will work because you know when I fill the car up completely full, it's gonna be putting pressure on the pump from the opposite side. I don't think it's gonna be enough for this pump to necessarily struggle, but we'll find out when we're driving. Literally, I don't think there could be a worse thing to do to a car than take stickers off. So I peeled off the majority of the identifying marks of the car. So there's no orange stickers down the side anymore. The 818's off the side, which it needed to change anyways to 878, because Calvin will be driving this at the track and I get to stay 818. You're gonna be like, oh my gosh, the orange stripe is gone. Okay. I peeled off this section of stripe on the bumper. It's about 10 inches long, 10 inches for sure. And literally, this took me 45 minutes. The time lapse you just saw, five seconds, 45 minutes. It sucked. All the rock chips, the vinyl was a mess. So I opted for the electrical tape camouflage. So I taped over my stripe with electrical tape in order to hide from other cars. So the orange stripe is still here. It just so happens it's under black electrical tape and on the Nordic green car, it's basically invisible, especially at nighttime. So right up here, I ran out of electrical tape. Need to do a little trimming on that one, but still got this piece of orange, this orange and the back. So I need to get another roll, but it is time for me to pretty much call it a day. I'm pretty sure I'm as prepared as I need to be prepared to make this drive. So let's go over the car. Taking a look at how the car sits exactly as we're ready to leave, here are a couple updates I've made after I took a 400 mile round trip down to Nashville and back with let's just say a spirited trip time. This car does not love sitting at 140 mile an hour. It makes 140 horsepower, guys. This is a 1.3 liter, two rotor NA engine. This is nothing fancy here. This is about the dullest knife in the drawer. And we're going to be pushing it to the limits to try to keep up this average to get our goal of sub 30 hours. So I'd love to be 29 something. 20 something would be crazy. I think it's a little overzealous after driving the car to Nashville and back. But we're going to do our best to make it on the list for the Cannonball stuff. For sure, we will have the fastest rotary Cannonball car. As long as we keep all of our apex seals for the entire drive. So I've put two new tires on the back. I had a slight vibration from the right rear that I didn't quite like. The vibration is now gone. So I have the left rear as my spare. These RX-8s didn't come with a spare, so we've got it inside the car. In addition to the tires, we adjusted the alignment. So took this down to the dealership where Calvin works, got it up on the rack. I left the little bit of camber that I have in the front. So we're sitting at about 2.8 degrees, just under three. That's basically the max you can get out of an RX-8. And this car was primarily a track car. So I never drove it on the street really, just drove it at the racetrack for the past couple of years. So it had a really aggressive alignment in it. I had one degree total of toe out in the car. So a half on each side, we reduced that down to a half a degree of toe out total. So a quarter on each side. What I'm looking for at that little bit of toe out is just to, to keep the car 
tracking straight so that it gives good feedback. This car has about seven degrees of caster in it, which is a lot. So it self steers really well, which helps for our, our high speed stability. Now, the reason to leave the camber in, y'all, like you're gonna put 6,000 miles on this car. Basically, you're gonna destroy this set of tires. The camber, I think, is gonna help a little bit with these more balloony style all season tires. I was gonna take the camber out, but ultimately, if we're trying to you know, take a corner at a pretty hefty speed. A more grippy tire like a 200 Treadwear is gonna stick even when it rolls over versus these being like a 500 Treadwear aren't exactly gonna like that and they're really gonna roll under. So I left the camber in the front. I also think part of my rear end vibration could have been a little bit of toe. So my car, I guess, had changed its alignment settings at a track day. I've spun it out. Hadn't really checked the alignment since. And I had a little bit more toe in the right rear than the left rear. All of that aside, let's look at the inside of the car because that's where the major changes have happened. Other than those things I've listed, it's mostly just a stock RX-8. It has a HKS cat back on it. That's quiet. I took the single exit off a while back, as you guys saw, and it's a stock engine. Inside the car is where I'm super proud of how this has come out. So we'll start at the trunk. We got the fuel tank, I've got my fuse bus for the fuel pump, and I ran an extra 12 volt up there just in case something happens. So I've got two wires in case one burns up or something weird, just a nice fail safe, some extra fuses in there. Electrical kit, a pretty substantial tool kit, floor jack, the jack handle, everything back here because I had gutted the car. It didn't have any carpet in it, so I put some just blankets down to help reduce the noise from the back of the car and keep the fuel cell from rattling on stuff. It is still a big aluminum tank. You know, there's no bead rolls in it, so it does oil can a little bit. We've got some extra wire down here, just in case, an extra relay. I've got fuses and stuff in the electrical kit. The battery's back there. We'll bring a jump pack of sorts. Inside the car, you, you definitely couldn't do this with a Corvette. I don't think I would cannonball run in a Corvette. It would just be, I, I don't know how those guys did it. There's it would be terrible. You'd have to stop for fuel so much and you wouldn't be able to bring anything. You just have to hope your car didn't break. So I'm kind of prepared for everything with having, with my experience racing rally, you be prepared for everything in your car because when you're on rally stage, you're the only ones that can fix it. So we've got the tire inflator back here. My spare sits perfectly between the fuel tank and the passenger seat. In addition to, I've got a spare set of plug wires, plugs, ignition coils. I've got a spare fuel pump in here in case we need that. Some nice painter's tape, some aluminum foil tape in case there's any sort of, you know, smells or things coming from back here. You can see the welding blanket laying over the fuel cell. So we will have to flip the blanket up and then untape where we fill because I can't fill from the trunk. So I've got to fill this tank through the cabin, which is less than ideal, but ideally, you know, the smell was terrible without having any of this in here. The smell is really not that overpowering right now. It's still a little smelly, but we'll be fine. We've got air conditioning in this car so we can fresh air circulate. I cleaned the cabin filters. We're all good to go. As far as, you know, the regular good old, what everybody's here for, which is as far as our police countermeasures, I've got a unit in R7. The R8's a little pricey guys. So we're not, you know, full crazy can afford to pay Ferrari level tickets here. We're driving an RX-8, so this is pretty high class for us. Unit in R7, I'm gonna be running JVB1 on my phone, just the standalone. Calvin's gonna have Waze going on his phone. We're gonna be tracking ourselves with our just Google location history, Calvin's Apple location history, in addition to just a regular old timer up here, taking pictures at the before and the after, and I'm gonna have probably my time-lapse camera going for the entirety of the drive. So you'll at least be able to freeze frame the time-lapse camera to see the, the sections of it. And I'll, you know, post the unedited time-lapse somewhere if anybody doubts us. Good bit of data to back up our run. I've got my Garmin for riding mountain bikes and stuff. I'm not sure if I can use that like people would use a normal Garmin GPS to track a trip. So we'll do our best to make sure we track everything. But other than just the radar detector, JVB1 and Waze, that's gonna be the extent of our police countermeasures. So we're in an RX-8, we can't go 150 miles an hour, guys. This, the car just mechanically can't do it. For sixth gear with this tall of a tire and a 444 rear axle ratio at 9,000 RPM. I mean, my guess is that that's probably a top speed of about 100 and, on 158, maybe 157. It's gotta be pretty close to the Radix 7 with a shorter tire and a 
and a taller gear ratio. So anyways, so it's not ideal. This is not a Mercedes. It's not a vet. We're not going to be going that fast all the time, but I'm ideally hoping the car does comfortably cruise in the triple digits. So the goal will be to cruise in the triple digits as best we can. I think that that's still going to be enough to hit our goal. We're just going to have to really, really maximize the amount of time we're able to spend there. If we've got to run like, you know, 130 or 140 we can easily run it up that fast and then coast back down i just don't think that this thing is going to like to cruise at 140 or 130 because that's literally 7,000 rpm and you know it's a rotary it eats the rpm up but 7,000 rpm for three and a half hours straight let alone 30 hours straight it's just going to wreak havoc on the steel so i am going to be pre-mixing i still have the sewn adapter we're changing the oil when we get to new york so this thing should be basically as ready as we can possibly be. So a little bit of room for a cooler, my camera gear, our bags, you know, up on top of this and a little bit of extra room in the trunk, but it is gonna be tight. It's still just an extended cab sports car. If this door had a door panel, it wouldn't close because the tire would be in the way. Close is perfect. It's weird seeing this thing in like boring trim without all the stripes and the numbers and all that because it's kind of all I've been seeing. I am gonna leave my stickers on the windows but I'm gonna tape over them, at least the most identifying ones. You're not gonna be able to see the, the gold phalanx one, I don't think, and these two stickers, like that one's orange from the Tale of the Dragon, my Mazda Speed sticker. For Paul Walker, we'll have to tape all that up. But otherwise, I think if we're ripping down the road, this is a pretty unassuming little car. I'm gonna leave it dirty and chipped up and painted up and all nasty because, well, it's still just an old RX-8. So I'm excited. I cannot freaking wait to make this drive. It's one of those things that like, I've dreamed of making this drive for a long time. You know, we watched Smokey and the Bandit growing up a bajillion times, Duke's a Hazard. The Cannonball Run, I wouldn't say, was like a super common movie that I watched a bunch of times, but I've seen the movie, you know? It's a funny movie. It doesn't really have like the best plot, but the drive is still one of those things that Calvin and I have always wanted to do. And what better way to do it than do it in a rotary engine car? You know, we're Mr. Rad. We love the rotaries around here. It's literally, live, eat, and breathe fire-breathing rotaries. So I think the rx is the best rotary-powered car for it. I think any FD RX-7 would fall apart. I don't think there's an FC RX-7 on the planet that would be wiring reliable enough to drive that far. I think the security light would come on or the low coolant buzzer would come on and that'd be so annoying to have to deal with. And honestly, you could do it in a first-generation RX-7, but no first-generation RX-7 likes to be triple digit speed it's like going 150 miles an hour in a smart car they're just like they're so small and they're just not really engineered for it so i think the 8 is our best option i don't really think that a turbo rx8 or anything would be any better i, I think the improvements you're going to need to make to this car and i'm speaking a little bit you know out of experience here but want to include it is you know ultimately the gearing i i think you know, these cars are geared for like a short track car for autocross. They're geared to take advantage of 120. They're geared to take advantage of 200 horsepower. You know, these aren't geared for the Autobahn. So, you know, doing this sort of top speed thing in one of these, not really ideal. But people have done gumball rallies and Acura NSXs and such. And, and I think we'll be able to keep up. You know, this car is set up for the racetrack. So it's got all the cooling mods we could need to stay cool. It's been dead nuts reliable for me, knock on wood. Oh, and I can't wait to drive this thing up to New York and then make the drive. So these videos are not coming out exactly as we've done it. They're coming out kind of before and then kind of after, So, but in succession. So get excited because the next video you guys see is gonna be us making the drive. And I am, I'm pumped guys. This is gonna be super fun. And uh, I can't wait. You're gonna see two smiling Hawaiian shirt dudes ripping across the country and it's gonna be a it's going to be a good old time. So with that, thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you guys so much for subscribing, checking out the Patreon. If you're on Patreon, huge thanks to those guys. They make all of this stuff possible. And uh, I can't wait. Cannonball stuff is going to be rad. We'll have the Turbo 8 fixed up by the time y'all are seeing the second video. And we'll hopefully be going like pretty dang fast in the Rad X7. So with that, live a life you don't need a vacation from. Keep it rad. Whew. Guys, this is gonna be, this is gonna be insane. The thing that's crazy, everybody I've told this, that we're gonna do in this cannonball thing, they're like, you're an idiot, why would you do that? And I'm like, well, you're only young once, right? So we're only 28 years old. 
27 years old, one time, and I think now's the time that we can spare to stay up for 30 something hours straight without sleeping or just take a nap in a car and literally spend three and a half straight days in a car because we have to drive to New York. So that's 13 hours. We're gonna stay the night, we're gonna leave early in the morning, and then we're gonna drive all the way across the country, 2,800 miles. So, you know, that's 30 hours of time, ideally, or 32 or whatever it is. And then we're in Los Angeles. So it's not like we just, we're just done at that point. It's like at that point, we gotta turn our, you know, happy butts around and go home. And we gotta drive 1,700 miles home back to Indiana. So yeah, we might be stupid, but we're living an amazing life, doing cool things. How many other people have done a cannonball run? Probably not that many. So if anything, at the end of this video, get out and do something cool. Do something you enjoy. That's what makes life worth living. Peace.